So, yeah, so I, I was sort of parachuted in sort of very last minute to, to do this because uh, Ben Holworth was going to do this. Um, 10 o'clock last night. So on my behalf. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there are, there's not a lot to look at, but I will just... So, yeah, forgive me for any terminology issues or anything like that because I'm not quite as technical as, as Ben would be on this. Um, uh, but, yeah, so I'm, so I'm Joel from Leeds City Council. Um, uh, so bit of background, our, our transport strategy, I think like a lot of other cities um, now, it, it's really focused on um, sort of active travel and, and bus, what well, bus, <laughs> for, for Leeds it's only bus, uh, bus priority. Um, so the bus is really fundamental to, to that work in, and I think, I think sort of recognised in Leeds that historically there's been a lot of good work in bus priority, but perhaps then in more recent times it's, it's not, it's kind of, not been completely forgotten about, but it's, we've not done as much as, as we probably should. Um, so we're now doing a lot of work around that and have been for the past sort of, I say, three, four, five years. Um, so one of the developments that, that we worked with Swarco and, and Talent on um, was actually introducing the, the Arctic T031 um, message um, directly into the controller. So. So we have a, what we call a data relay unit that, um, that Tony Smith provides for us. Um, and what that does is basically bring in all the feeds from the various operators and then it, and then it pings the, the Arctic message out to wherever it needs to be. Um, obviously some of those messages go into your central UTMC system for use in those strategies, but um, Tim touched on, on Mover. Um, Historically, if you wanted bus priority through a central system to move, uh, then it would have to be through a combination of bits, and it was a special condition and a bit of a pain. Um, so that's now replaced with um, just this, this direct interface into the controller, um, which gets rid of a lot of the latency. Um, and it's worked really well. So we're kind of building that up now in, in all the sites that we've got move the control on. Um, from a central UTC, um, point of view, we're developing a new, our own sort of new optimizer. Um, we've, we've put in, uh, I've probably heard of them, but the Viva City sensors. Um, so we're using those across the city centre, and the data that they bring in um, is sort of sub-second, um, sort of GPS position style data. Um, so we, we're developing our own systems around being able to use that sort of data, and that's kind of what kicked off. Um, the push to do what, what I'm going to show you today. So again, like Tim's touched on the fact that the current system, it's really quite um, heavy on, on officer time to work through trigger files and make sure that they're, you know, they're working properly. And then you get those to the bus operators and then they put them on the ticket machines. And you know, if you want to then move a trigger because you realise it's not in quite the right place, then it could be another couple of weeks before that feeds through to the, the bus operators. And it, yeah, it, it's a good system, but there are some frustrations in there. So, um, so we want to improve that performance. I think it's worth saying as well that that it's it's we've always wanted to do bus priority, but I think as more and more authorities, um, I, I would suggest in future we'll be looking at things like franchising bus priority is even more important because it's a direct cost then to the local authority, you know, journey times for buses and the running cost of the buses, that, that is impacting on, um, on that side of things. So we need, we need to get it right for a number of reasons. Um, so we've got, we've recently then, we've been pushing for a while with the bus operators um, in terms of wanting to look at whether we can get, rather than the uh, the, the triggers as they stand now where it's like spot detection and you know, obviously you get that trigger say 100 metres from the junction and then another one 50 metres, wherever you put them. Um, we want to look at whether we can track the buses through um, and move some of that processing on, onto our side so that we've got the flexibility to be able to set, set the prior, priority up how we, how we like. Um, so so that's, that's where we're coming from. We've recently then, um, one of our bus operators um, has shown quite a lot of interest in it um, because actually from a bus operator's point of view having um, more frequent location updates is helpful for the real-time systems so it, there's, there's a bit of this on, on both sides um, and so that's led to us um, starting a trial 
um, which we are doing on one of our park and rides. So it's initially on five buses, it's a controlled environment because we know those vehicles operate that park and ride. Um, and we are currently waiting for the feed to be set up. So the kit's on the buses now and we're waiting for the feed. Um, but I will show you some data from, from kind of a data dump from another very similar um, bit of work that was done in Bended in the North East, so you can see the sort of data we're talking about. Um, so just on the trigger side, hopefully you can see that. Um, so this is, this is look at the, the existing system, looking at the existing system. And so the different operators have kind of set, set their ticket machines, their triggers up uh, with different radiuses on there, because they, they put it in as a kind of a, a circular point. Um, on a map and I mean it, you know obviously we're talking about trying to do some fairly fine control of, of signals some of the triggers that, that we found were set up in on the on the lead system not on our system but um, in the bus operators ticket machines um, 60 meter radius some I think we're even up at 8 meter rate this is radius so I mean, this is a huge area um, so, so obviously one of the pieces of work we did was say, well, hang on a minute, you know, at the very least, we need to be bringing it down. Um, 20 meter radius is still huge, but, but it starts being a bit more usable. But you can see that then the number of triggers that successfully fire drops off quite a lot when you get to that point, and some of those issues come down to GPS accuracy, and actually some of the, the ETMs, because um, the GPS, GPS antenna, as far as I understand it, is sometimes integrated within the unit, actually the performance is not that brilliant. So another thing is that actually unearthing that allows you to then talk to the bus operators about saying, well actually, can you, can you do a bit of work to put maybe your antennas on, I don't know, on top of the bus, wherever, <laughs> to get a bit of a better performance. So, um, but I think it all, it all kind of pushes towards the fact that it's, it's better for us if we have a little bit more visibility of actually the position of the bus, because we can see is that accurate enough or not, um, and, and work with that. So, um, I'll just show you. So, this is a, the, the Stone Park and Ride route um, into Leeds. It's, it's quite a well protected route for buses, um, but it runs through a number of mover sites and then it runs into um, fixed time signals. Um, so, some fixed time signals still in the city centre, and then some that are operating on, on VA um, in, in the middle of the city centre at the moment. So. We've got a good opportunity to kind of try these things out at, um, on various different types of control. And this is a, a data plot um, from the work that, that Ben looked at in the northeast. So you can see this is second by second data that's coming out of the, the ticket machine. Um, and what, what Ben's just done is to show the sort of traditional circular um, trigger point that's in the sort of light yellow colour, um, and then his sort of uh, customised um, rectangular trigger point. Um, and, and that's th the point there is that actually, again, us having flexibility to do, to do a little bit more customisation of how we, how we actually um, provide triggers. You can see where, where, the, where the bus, where the GPS is slightly out um, for whatever reason, um, or it doesn't quite follow the, the, the line of the road. If you've got a circular trigger point, your chances of catching that data point within that circle um, are vastly reduced as you, as you go towards the edge of that. Whereas if you have a rectangular um, trigger point, you're much more likely to, to, to do that. And, and I think Ben then showed, um, sort of looking across that route, that you can get I think it was pretty much sort of a hundred percent hit rate on the triggers with the rectangular ones. Um, so that, that that's just one example of the benefit. Um, so what we're envisaging is that we're then going to end up with a sort of hybrid system where um, we're going to have lots of legacy sites that are on, say, mover control, where they will accept um, the kind of old style trigger points. Not to say old style, the current current trigger points. So we will use these or this, this sort of interface um, that we're, we're going to develop to, to trigger the old style um, T031 messages that we can then send straight out to, to move a science for use. So that'll just act like it does now. Um, but then on some of the city centre stuff where we're developing our own optimizer, we'll actually be able to feed 
the data points directly into the system um, in the same way that we're doing with the sensor data um, to, get, to get sort of better control. And just a final thing is that the second by second data is actually really useful um, in terms of where you've got, say, like bus stops just upstream of a junction and you want to give priority to buses, but if you don't know whether they're going to stop or not, that's, that's actually quite difficult. But if you've got this sort of data, you can then start um, uh, working out, uh, and you've got your signal detection as, as well for, for your standard traffic. You can start inferring whether that bus is going to slow down to stop or not, and you can cancel detection, uh, um, or if not, you can give it greater detection than you otherwise would be able to because you're not quite sure where it's going to be. So, so we think that it's got quite a lot of potential, this. Um, obviously, there's, there's, you know, it's going to be a completely different way of processing the data. Um, <coughs> But yeah, we, we think it's got, <coughs> got legs. So there you go, that's my... Uh, Any questions for Joe? Sorry, yeah, sorry. No. Sorry. sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Joe, have you known that bus is running uh, early, late or on time? <coughs> ah, well, so I suppose that's, that's the reason for today, really. That So at, at the moment... Um, we're expecting from the feed to get sort of fairly raw sort of GPS position data, but what we want to do is to get um, to get the same type of data that you would get now in the in the um, T031 feed, um, and obviously we would like yeah things like service service ID as well and the VIN or one or the other at least some identifier that we can then use to cross reference, um, because then you know which way it's going to turn as well. So that's that's. That's a useful addition, but yeah. So, so we would like that data in, but we're going to have to work with the um, supplier to to try and make sure that that comes through. But that's point of the trial, I suppose. I'm curious to understand the Newcastle trial. <coughs> if we can't name the, the people you work with, that's fair enough. But the devices that we used, the one hertz system, have you considered any other data pole frequency? Um, so, I think the challenge that we see with this is we're conflating GPS accuracy with GPS frequency. Because um, those are two different issues, and you know, you think about a three thousand bus network. How much data are you processing through your central system to overlay vehicle schedule adherence? And if you're using that for prediction accuracy, do we really need uh, a one second position update? Or if we have high strength dead reckoning, could we get away with not or two? Uh, potentially. I mean, I, I think the higher frequency is useful for, for various, obviously for the operators as well. If um, so clear down messages so that you don't have the bus saying it's still due when it's left the stop and all that sort of thing. Um, I think that's still useful, but you're right, there are two two issues. I mean, I I would say ideally we'd have the frequency, and I know it's a lot of data, but there, there are a finite number of buses on the network. It's not like the same issue as connected vehicle data of having sort of sub-second data from thousands of vehicles. Um, so I, I, I think it's... I think the processing size is probably doable, um, but I still think there is going to need to be a push for the bus operators to improve the position of the antennas because, yeah, it, but, but hopefully that will come fr from their real-time side as well because they're, they're interested in it from that perspective. Probably not, not that they're not bothered about the bus priority, but they're more bothered about the, the kind of passenger experience, sort of immediate experience, I think, than that. Um, so, so, yeah, again, I think for those authorities that, that are looking at franchising, that might be something that, that they need to think about building into the... Uh, and enhanced partnerships. You could do this, a similar thing, couldn't you? So if you, if you theoretically think that you're getting a VMV every 30 seconds with vehicle location that you know, uh, an authority would use, <coughs> we're multiplying that data and not by 30. So that will have a, a knock-on on the, on the operating expenditure for, for all those SIM cards. How is that cost being offset by the theoretical gain of having a system? Is, is something that we're interested to know as suppliers. Yes, and I think um, f for me, and this is where I don't have any control over it, but if I was a supplier or, or a bus operator, I'd be looking to the suppliers to say, well, hang on a minute, you, you, only one of those messages every 30 seconds need to be the full verbose thing that sends all of this extra data that we don't need. The other messages can just be a, a small... A, a light message. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, yeah, we can suggest that, but we don't have any direct control over it. So, so, but I'd suggest that's the way around it. That, that yeah, you could limit because it's really quite a small message. Otherwise, yeah. Um, but yeah. 
And sorry for one last question as well. Are you able to share any details of the on vehicle um, hardware you're using to produce this, this data? So I, I can share it in this room. I don't know. What it is. Um, it, so basically, yeah, the, the operator that we're doing the trial is first bus, and the kit is the gateway of its ticket to the kit because they've already got tickets on on those kind of auditions for that. So. And it, that's the same gateway device for the northeast, but a different operator. Yes, that's my understanding. Yeah. 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 And if you're looking to you know, go into the market and say this is a new system that's coming through, because there's loads of buses with very old issues that will need new hardware to make this work. Yeah, so in West Yorkshire, the vast majority of the operators, apart from small ones, all use the ticket to kit at the moment. So I think, I think their kit is relatively up to date, um, but they obviously all need this addition if they're going to expand it across the fleet. Um, yeah, again, I think if, if West Yorkshire went down the route of franchising, or it might, be, it might come in one of the in-house partnerships, it may come as one of the future schemes we've got in the pipeline. Um, it might be something that you build into that to say actually if you want, you know, as part of operating if you need to invest in that kit. The small operators I'd say is a problem because for them it's a they don't even have a VM feed into bots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, but but again you could potentially maybe provide that somehow through the franchising. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good <laughs> <Good sir. laughs> Um, yeah, you mentioned about uh, the fact that um, some sort of manufacturers, including Swap and ourselves, have um, integrated the Arctic message passing in the air station controller. Um, and so that's working well. Do you have any sort of objective evidence as to just how well that works? Um, so we've got a few case studies because we've, as part of the CRSTS funding package, we have, we're sort of doing more monitoring and evaluation than we've we probably did before. Um, so we started to put case studies together and, and I mean there's one example actually on, on the park and ride route um, of using that where um, yeah we're saving, we're saving a significant amount. I'd have to go back to the plots to work out how much but I think it, you, you're talking about like a minute in, in either direction um, on average because, it, because we're Giving the buses kind of top level priority, but obviously that 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 amount is going to differ. But I think the, the bit that's very difficult to quantify is the is the amount of saving in officer time to set the stuff up, and then the amount of sites that will actually then work properly because because it's a lot easier um, than doing like bit patterns and special conditioning. And if that's wrong, you've got to go back and do it. And does it ever get sorted properly? Do you see a, a bigger improvement on sites that where messages are also going through? Yeah, so I mean they're, they're the sites that we were that that we were tackling really. So obviously the, the sites that are already on UTC, they continue to go through spruce. The, the, these sites are the ones that would be on move, but like ice, the control is isolated anyway. It's local control and it's just able to bypass the UTC system effectively to, to bank the message straight out there. So yeah, it, it is and, and we know the, although the latency through through Spruce and um, TMS is kind of a known in a sense, we know it was kind of a couple of seconds. Um, so so chopping that out is really beneficial. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's I mean it is a really <laughs> can't understate it's a really good development. Is that it's it's been really really helpful. Um. Just wonder whether you thought about any variable frequency. Um, just something we were discussing earlier, actually, about whether you sort of go into a bus quality zone, and actually up to that point, you perhaps you don't need it every second. Yeah. You know, but so you go, you're out in a wider network, 30 seconds is fine, and where is the bus? Actually, you come into the bus quality zone, where the signalised junctions, okay, now start sending it as quick as you can. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I think at this stage, so we, we've talked first about that, because obviously they're worried about their trust, you know, yeah. part, again, part of the reason for the child. Um, and yeah, that is something that we we will look at. I think we're going to look at second by second, see if that is actually an issue or not. Because a lot of it's kind of conjecture. Is it, oh, it's good, but it might not be a problem at all. Um, but if it is, then we can start looking at. Because the other thing is, at very low speeds, if the bus comes to a stop, do you need to keep sending it every second, or do you just wait for it to start again? So, so yeah, there, there, there's various things. It's also conditions. You can almost turn off the deluge data when you don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. 
there are knock-on benefits to having high-resolution data for analytical purposes, not just operational. Yes, I did uh, on my first slide. I did actually put one of the secondary benefits of being able to yeah monitor that um, sort of second by second really help. Yeah, you can get seriously good dwell time measures if you have second by second, um, and you can get seriously good resolution in, in in high congestion areas to understand what the actual speed through junctions are, for example. And quality of prediction, right? Uh, exactly. RTPI and clear exactly. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I think I think I think the cost is a, is, is a relative red herring when it comes to data frequency. Yeah. yeah, can I can I make a couple of observations? Um, from, this is probably from when D31 was, was originally generated, which is a while back. Um, one is that you, you mentioned the idea about um, to improve accuracy by putting a, an antenna on the roof. Operators don't like doing that historically because that means cutting through the bodywork and taking cables down in difficult places and maintained places. So doing so may get some resistance from there. Now, you can do wireless solutions, but yeah, it, it all gets a bit mucky. Um, so you may be stuck, for operational reasons, with having machine-integrated antennas. Um, the other thing was related to, uh, I think it was a question about um, the type of information, which buses request priority? Or how much priority is requested based on this bus maintenance, based on coolness. When we were designing it, the operator said, no, 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 we don't want to do any of that. That's, that's, we, we just want to chuck, here is a bus, over to you, the traffic operator, let you decide how it best flows around the network. And if that means that buses that are running on time or even early um, get priority, well, that's, that's fine, we'll, we'll, we'll cope with that, we'll, we'll just pull the thing over and dwell it for a bit. Um, that may have changed. It may be that operators are now more willing to say, I will only request for buses that, that meet these criteria, or I will, I will prioritise requests for buses which are running very late or something. Um, I don't know if we have any operators in the room, but that would be, a, that would be an interesting question to ask. Historically, that's not been the case. To my surprise, actually. Even better, if it's a problem probably when they're competing. Again, you know, un under it might be easier for those who already have franchising or something like that to say, well, you could dynamically do that because across the board, if you had a system that was clever enough predicting, you know, or timetabling kind of um, trying to keep um, separation between the buses, it could be telling us which bus is the most important to get through at the signals. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, certainly so far in these, we, we just bang every bus through the same on the basis that it probably helps the operators actually know that they all get treated the same and, and help with the timetabling. But I think it depends, yeah, what type of route it is, because some of them they're looking at um, headways, some of them they're looking at... Yeah, treatment yeah. services and all that kind of stuff. But at least one of Tim's uh, architectures on the, on the screen earlier allows for that quite straightforward. If you're running the, the vehicle fees through an RTPI system and then into the UTC, the RTPI system could decide whether it wants to request priority with that vehicle or not, subject to operating grid. We're, we're very much doing that sort of thing. Right, there you go. Yeah. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.